what can I do? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm awake. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to give you a handout this morning, uh, but I will when we catch up with this next time. I want to speak, uh, we're going to go through it a little bit differently, then we're going to come back to this section. And this is in Acts chapter 18. Um, so is the temperature okay? Everybody's good? Yeah? Okay, here we go. Uh, it's on, isn't it? Okay. Um, we're in, uh, we're moving from Acts 17 into Acts 18, and we're going to look at Paul at Corinth. I have many people in this city. When we left Paul uh, the week before last, we left Paul at Athens and he was standing in front of the intellectual elite of Athens on Mars Hill. Athens was the intellectual city of its day, the Oxford, the Cambridge, the Hong Kong University, the, the uh, Harvard, the whatever um, of its day. And Paul stood in front of the intellectual elite of the city and he presented to them a God that was very different from all the gods that they knew. He said, I present to you and I tell you about the unknown God. And he was this unknown God that Paul presented to them was so, so very different. He told them about God the Creator, not a God who was part of creation and that needed something from man's hands or lived in man-made temples. Instead, he made everything. And instead of needing something from his creation, he was the all-sufficient one. He was the one who didn't demand something from his creation, but instead, as Paul said, gave life and breath to all. And this was new for the Athenians, that there was a God like this. He presented a personal God and a very present God, not a God who was far off, not a God who was uncaring, but who was close, a God that orchestrated history, a God who had put them in the place that they were that they might reach out and find him because he cared about them and he wasn't far from anyone. And then he said, this God requires a response because he's the true God. And so he presented to them to a group of people that were really mostly interested in window shopping. Let's talk about the latest ideas. Don't you like to window shop? Well, there's, it doesn't cost, window shopping doesn't cost anything, does it? Window shopping, oh, there's this and there's this and there's this. And you know what? The Athenians were window shopping. They could look at this and they could look at that. They could discuss, but they didn't have to make any decision. And Paul presented to them a God that you couldn't, you couldn't window shop with this God. This God gave truth, and he gave a way through Jesus, and he said, because you know truth, and because I give Jesus, you're required to respond. And the God that Paul presented to the Athenians is the same God that we know today and that we present today. All of those things are the same. And you know, as we've talked about, much of what Paul said to the Athenians is, is pretty much the way that we share Jesus today with many people. But as I said, the Athenians were more interested in window shopping. They didn't want to make a decision. Have you ever talked with somebody? Oh, they're interested to talk, to talk with you. But if they have to decide, if they have to make a choice, if they have to give up some things to, to gain God, if their lives have to change in some ways, there are many people who say, no, thank you. But they're very tolerant, aren't they? They won't, they won't gather up a mob and run you out of town. They'll listen politely and sometimes they'll mock you and they'll laugh a little bit. And because the Athenians were civilized and tolerant, they didn't gather up a mob and chase Paul out of town as had, as had happened in many of the other cities. Instead, basically they laughed him out of town or they mocked him out of town. Um, and that's often true, that's often true today. Um, people will listen for a little bit, but then they may mock you for, do you, do you really believe that? You, you really think that? 
And so Paul gives them Jesus, and that's their response. But I want to encourage you this morning, because we're going to look at what happened with Paul and what he went through and the lessons we have for us today. Because it doesn't end with, and they laughed him out of town. Actually, Athens ends with this, and I'm so glad it does, because we read, but some joined him and became believers, and among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, so that was part of that group um, that was listening, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so there was a response. It wasn't a big response, it wasn't a large response, but there was a response, and I'm, I'm glad it, it ends on a positive note, right? And so this is a good reminder to you and to me that we focus on the good response. It's really easy when things are happening to focus on the negative, right? That's sort of our human nature, isn't it? Instead, the Holy Spirit, who is a spirit of hope and of blessing and of grace and of the future, helps us to look at the good and the response. And so this is, um, this is the response. And then we go right in to Acts 18 and we see that he's here in Athens and then the next city he's going to go to is Corinth. Corinth is only about 50 miles away. It's really easy to get to. The roads are very good. He likely, um, he might have sailed, we don't know, but he likely just took the little land bridge. This land bridge was really narrow at its narrowest point, it was only about 15 kilometers wide, um, and this area was was well was um, was built up and was very uh, was very cosmopolitan in general. So he's going to go to Corinth next, and he's alone at this point, right? So he was in Athens. Remember, he had said, "Tell Timothy and Silas, to tell them to come quickly, as quickly as they can." Uh, and then he goes on to Corinth. And so Acts 18.1 says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And what we're going to find out, what we're going to see is that Athens was actually just a, a stopping off point. His goal actually was Corinth, not Athens. He was going to pass through um, Athens, but he was waiting for, Saul, uh, for Silas and for, for Timothy to come. And so then he goes on to Corinth um, uh, and, and not, uh, not waiting for them any longer. So there he goes from right there. And... So I want us to think this morning, why didn't Paul stay longer in Athens? Was it because there wasn't a lot of response? Uh, was he discouraged because of it? Apparently not. Apparently Paul was following a spirit, spirit, Holy Spirit guidance, Holy Spirit direction, and Holy Spirit given strategy as he then went on to Corinth. And so he goes on to Corinth. And the distance, as I said, between the two, maybe 50 miles, which is, what, 70-ish, 75 kilometers, maybe something about like that. And so the distance was short, but the difference between these two cities was great. Do you remember about how big Athens was? When we look back, we think, if I were to ask you, which is the greater city, Athens or Corinth, what would you say? We'd all say Athens, right? We, we know of Athens today, but at that time, the greater city was Corinth. Athens was a city of maybe 27,000 people. At this point, it had, lost, it had lost its former glory. But Corinth was a city that may have had up to 300,000 citizens, between two and 300,000 citizens, and about 400,000 or more slaves in the city. And to us that seems incredible. That many. That was the Roman Empire at that time. So it was a huge city. And because of its location, it was a city of wealth. Um, all the trade routes passed through there. This little land bridge when the small ships, uh, the, the seas were dangerous around here. And so the smaller sailing vessels would go right here. And they had made a special road uh, with logs and smaller boats. They would completely bring them up out of the harbor and they would roll them along those 15 kilometers and they'd come off on the other side. The bigger sailing vessels, the merchant vessels, they would reach there. They would offload the, uh, the uh, uh, goods and everything, and then they would roll them along this road 15 kilometers to the other side. The ship would sail around. The bigger ones were, were uh, or they would t get other ones. They'd pick up the cargo and then they'd head on. So because of this, it was a really, really wealthy city, far wealthier than Athens. Because of this also, because there were so many sailors and merchants and trade routes going through, um, Corinth was not only famous for its wealth, Corinth was famous for its lifestyle, and it was famous for, it was infamous for its immoral, its openly immoral lifestyle. 
any time you have a, a port city or a harbor city where there are a lot of p ports going through, you all know that, don't you? There is often, there's, uh, there's a lot going on, right, in cities like that. And so Corinth actually had three harbors, not just two, but three harbors. There was one there, there, and then on that side as well. And so the sailors and the merchants and the ships and the trading vessels and all of these going through, they would stop off in Corinth and enjoy their lives in Corinth. In fact, the lifestyle was so infamous that, um, that if somebody lived a really openly immoral and ungodly lifestyle, um, even among the, the pagans or whatever, they were called, oh, they're Corinthian. They're Corinthian. So that tells us something. And it wasn't actually despised or looked down on. It's okay, that's just the way that they, that's just the way that they live. At the top of this, uh, in this city, um, so here are the ruins of, of uh, old Corinth. And at the, t at above, towering above the city, it's called the, a, a Coro Corinth. Um, actually, up there you can still see some of the ruins. There was a great temple to the goddess Aphrodite the goddess of love, the goddess of sexual love. And there was this great temple up there, and the temple had 1, 000, about 1,000 sacred prostitutes. Isn't there? And that was part of the religion. And they did their business and raised funds for the temple. And that was, that was the lifestyle of Corinth. So talk about a difference between Athens and Corinth. Um, when I was doing some studying, uh, later on, when you read the letter to the uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you can understand why he talks about some of the things that he does. Some of us maybe didn't know that background, and so um, look at this. Uh, when Paul writes to Corinth, by the way, when I was doing some studying, uh, this pastor from the West Coast in the U.S. said, hmm, when you read about Corinth and the Corinthian letter, really you could say it's the first and second letter to California because, it's, because that's kind of the lifestyle in California. But look with me very quickly at this, and we're not going to look much, but I want you to, to look at this. When Paul writes them, we can understand why he writes like this. He says, don't fool yourselves, those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves, greedy people, drunkards or abusive or cheat people will inherit God's kingdom. Those are strong words, aren't they? And we can understand when we know a little bit about Corinth why Paul would write this. But don't get stuck there because look at what Paul says next. Verse 11. Some of you were once like that. Yay! Isn't that great? Here, is the, here, is this, here are these horrible sins, these horrible lifestyles. And then Paul, when he's writing to the church in Corinth, says, some of you were just like that. I look at some of you here this morning, and I don't know all of your backgrounds. Some of you, I know your backgrounds. But you know what? In this bunch, we've got some pretty bad former apples. Some pretty bad former apples, right? Some formerly bad apples. <laughs> How shall I say it? You know what I mean, right? And actually, we were all a mess before Jesus, weren't we? But some of you, you look at your past, and sometimes some of you who have had a really hard past or a difficult past, or you've made really poor choices with your life in the past, and you think about, oh, my life is like this, 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 and this, and the devil condemns you, and you still feel guilty about those things, I want to remind you of what Paul says here. Paul writes to people who were adulterers, idol worshipers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusive, and cheaters. And he says, some of you were like that. And so I encourage you this morning as you look at that, but he says, some of you are once like this, but you are washed, you are made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen? amen? Amen. That's a big amen. That's a big amen, brothers and sisters. Can you see that? Sorry. I knew it was, I knew it was, low, it was low there, but you'd go back and look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 your, yourselves. But I want to encourage you, and I want to say one other thing. As Paul goes into Corinth, look with me at this, because we are going to talk a little bit about um, evangelism this morning, because that's what Paul is talking about here in Acts. And what I want to encourage you in is this as you look at it. When we talk with people about Jesus, it's 
Now we may say, hey, come visit our church. But brothers and sisters, the gospel message is not come visit our church. The gospel message is Jesus. The gospel message is hope and love and grace and forgiveness and a future in Jesus. That's the gospel message. There's healing. There's redemption. There's restoration. There's putting back together of the broken pieces of our lives in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. Never forget that. Keep that clear. Keep that strong in your hearts because that's certainly what Paul had as he went into Corinth. That's the gospel message. So no wonder Paul writes like this to, these, to the Corinthian church. By the way, he writes this, it's almost 10 years later, but that gives us a, a, a glimpse of what they were like before Jesus came into their hearts. So here's this infamous city of Corinth, and um, we're going to look at what Paul's strategy was in this tough city, okay? In, in this really tough city. So let's look at it, and... Um, Let's keep on reading. Okay. There, so he goes into Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So here we have these two people. We're not going to study them this morning, but these, this famous power couple. All of us know some power couples, right? If I'm thinking about the U.S., I'd say a power couple. I might say, oh, Beyonce and Jay-Z, or something <laughs> like that. I, I'm not lifting them up. They're not my heroes. But we think of power couples, right? Or Bill and Hillary Clinton, a power couple. I'm not lifting them up either, <laughs> okay? But I'm going to lift up Aquila and Priscilla. They were a power couple, okay? So Paul meets them. They had been kicked out of Rome by Claudius. You say, who's Claudius? Uh, not uh, Claudio. Okay, Maui, not, no relation to Maui this morning, okay? But this was the emperor right before Nero. Remember, Nero was the terrible emperor. So Claudius is the emperor. And apparently, um, historians believe there was somebody in Rome who was named Crestus. And he kept on causing trouble. But Crestus was often misspelled. And a lot of historians think that Claudius thought, oh, it's Christus the spelling for Jesus Christ, for Christ, and Claudius thought this person, Christ, is in Rome and he's causing problems. And so these Christians, everybody, get out of Rome, get out of Rome. And so that's why we're there. We don't know, but that's what a lot of historians think. And so they were kicked out of Rome, and um, Paul goes to see them, and he was a tent maker as they were, so he stayed and he worked with them. So I want to pause on that, because that's something really practical. We look at this, there's nothing about Jesus in this passage at all. There's nothing about preaching the gospel in any way, but Paul meets them. We're going to find out some more about them later, next time, uh, this great power couple, um, and how God can use couples, um, and how God, sorry, I know it's Father's Day, don't, I don't want to take this the wrong way. Don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. But most believe that uh, in, in certain aspects, um, Priscilla is usually named before Aquila. And so that says something perhaps about her spiritual gifts. So we'll talk about that later. Um, here, Aquila is named first, but for most, almost all the other times, then Priscilla comes first. So that w they usually think that, that says something. So he's a tent maker, they're a tent maker, and here's, uh, uh, you say, well, the, the, the quality, the resolution isn't very good on that picture. I did it on purpose, because it's a really old picture, and that gives us some idea of what the tents may have been like. Remember that Paul was a rabbi, and um, rabbis in the Jewish tradition were always taught a manual trade. They were taught to do something with their hands, and that was honorable, that was a good thing to do. Don't want lazy people. Okay, and we don't want like you don't want to be a lazy person in the kingdom of God, right? Paul has plenty to say about it, and so Paul was a tent maker, and so he starts making tents with him. Paul was from an area around Tarsus. In that area, there were these special goats, and the goat hair was wonderful for weaving and making these tents that travelers would often use. So Corinth was a great place to make tents because so many travelers were going through. And so he supported himself for a while by making tents. So I have a question. I don't know about you, but I would have a question. Well, here's the great Paul. He's a great evangelist. He's a great ap apostle. He's a great, you name it, he's kind of great in, e in every way. Why is he making tents? Because there was no church in Corinth and there were no Christians. The Bible's very clear, those that preach the gospel 
generally should live by the gospel. Should, should live by the gospel. And that's, a, that's, that's very biblical. But we'll see also at times um, that there are times when that's not possible. And so Paul is a tent maker. Remember also Silas and Timothy weren't there to help him. And so very, very simple. Paul has to eat. He, ha he has to eat. So he works. So he works. Um, I was talking with, uh, uh, with some of the uh, pastors, some of our pastors in, uh, in the Philippines. And you know we send some support to them through, sorry, you send some support to them. It's through your giving. But you know it's not a huge amount. And do you know that many of them, in addition to all the gospel work they're doing, they're planting gardens to support themselves. They're making ice cream and selling it. They're making peanuts and selling them in the little... Uh, in the little, what, what are those stores, sorry, sorry stores, or things like that, right? Um, like that to, 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 because everything is increasing in the Philippines, so they're working. I am so grateful. Brothers and sisters, this is uh, uh, beside the point, but I want to say it to you anyhow. The missionaries you support and that we support in the Philippines, I promise you, not one of them is lying in a hammock under a tree enjoying the good life because we send them finances. <laughs> They work. They work. In fact, we like them to rest more than they do. In fact, sometimes we say, you must take a day off. But praise God for diligent servants of the Lord. And so, Paul works just as, just as they work. Um, and then on Sabbaths, what does he do? We go a little bit further. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. That was the Sabbath. What day is the Sabbath? Saturday. Okay, I wanted to include a couple pictures here because this particular road is part of the road in ancient Corinth that was uncovered. And I wanted to include this because this is a lintel stone, a stone over the, over the, uh, uh, over the doorway of the synagogue from that time. And there was apparently only one synagogue in Corinth. And it is from exactly the time when Paul was there. You know what that means? That means that Paul walked under that when he went into the synagogue and when he reasoned with the Jews and the Greeks. That's kind of exciting, isn't it? Exactly that. And so Paul was there. He goes to the synagogue. He's trying to, to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. And then Silas and, Silas and Timothy show up. Okay, let me ask you a question. Corinth, maybe 600, 700,000 people. How do Silas and Timothy find Paul? Come on. How? 700,000 people. He has not written a letter to them. He hasn't WhatsApped to them and said, hey, I'm in such and such and such a place. How do Silas and Timothy find Paul? He was in the synagogue. That's right. He was in the synagogue. Of course he was in the synagogue. The call of God was on his life. So when they come, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews. He focuses on them because they knew Old Testament scripture that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, why does he devote himself exclusively? Go back. Let, let me see how your memory is. Remember the church in Philippi later on? We talked about this, right? He wrote to them. He says, thank you for sharing with me in the ministry. Silas and Timothy are coming from the church in Philippi and Thessalonica, and they are bringing offerings. They're bringing offerings. So when they come with offerings, Paul can eat, and he doesn't have to work anymore. Uh, he doesn't have to work at his trade, and so then he focuses on that. So... He devotes himself to that, and he focuses first on the Jews um, because they have the Old Testament scripture. Okay, let's go on just a little bit. What are the results from Paul's evangelizing? They resisted and they blasphemed. Okay, how many of you have ever evangelized, evangelized and you have been resisted and people blaspheme? Yeah. A lot of us, right? A lot, a lot of us have. And you say, blaspheme, what does that mean? Um, they laugh or they mock. In this case, probably they were talking about Jesus and saying he wasn't the Messiah. That's, that's probably what that means. So let's do a little, just a little quick, how do we, what do we do when people resist and when they blaspheme? And by the way, these words are really strong words. So it's not just, oh, you have your belief, I have my belief. It's a lot stronger than that, okay? It's a lot stronger than that. So what are we going to do? Let's see what Paul does. He shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to preach to the Gentiles. Uh, have you ever tried that before? 
I'm innocent. <laughs> okay. No, we're not going to do that. But that was a Jewish thing that we can understand, right? But what I do think is this. If you try to tell people about Jesus, and often it may be a, a good friend or it may be a family member, and if it gets ugly, let me put it that way. Have you ever tried to talk with somebody about Jesus and it gets ugly? Yes. After a while, just stop. Just stop. Nothing good comes out of arguing. Nothing good comes out of arguing. Because you can, even if they, up here, if they know it, it's, their hearts will have to respond, right? So there's no point in arguing. And look at this, and if we look at this the wrong way, then we think, wow, Paul was so cold-hearted, right? Paul was like, huh, okay, I'm innocent. But Paul wasn't cold-hearted. Because if we read a little bit later, we know that Paul said, I wish that if it were possible, I could be accursed. I could go to hell so that my countrymates might go to heaven. That was Paul's heart. So when Paul says that, he's not being angry and saying, hmm, well, you're going to go to hell then. Forget you. It was not that at all, but it was this. And I was thinking about this yesterday, and we'll share just a little, just, just a little personally as we look at this as well. Paul had been called of God to go and to preach. He had a commission. He was told to do something, and he was doing it. But once he had done it, there were other people that still needed to hear. And brothers and sisters, I think sometimes we focus perhaps on one or two. We think, I've got to, I've got to. And there may be plenty of other people there who've not heard anything yet that we could share with. And so the time comes when you move on, you keep praying, and if God gives an opportunity, hearts that were at one time hard will then get soft. One good example of that is Miss Murley right here. Murley, would you wave your hand? She's so friendly and kind, but do you know that once upon a time, Murley was a persecutor of Pastora Rowena. Did you know that? Rowena would talk with her and Murley would laugh at her and mock her and say, I have my belief, you have your belief. And, and, but after a while, here she is this morning. Maybe one of the greatest supporters of Pastora Rowena now. You cannot change a heart, and I can't change a heart either. Listen, brothers and sisters, all we are called to do, we're just called to do what God tells us to do. And when Paul says, your blood is on your own heads, I wanna, I'm going to back up just a minute. Sorry, I, I did it. I included it on my last slide. Sorry, I know this is, un, this is bulky and un, unwieldy, but I want to back up. Does it back up to the last slide? No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, would you take me to the last slide? Just a minute. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, one back from that, sorry. Did I miss it? Do I have Ezekiel 33 up there anywhere? Sorry, take a quick look, Andreas. I, I wanted to share that with you. I may not have. Ah, okay. Sorry, I know this is a wall of text. I'm not going to read it all, but I want to give this to you. And I'd like you to read it on your own and think about it and pray it on your own. Because Paul shakes off this and then he says, your blood is on your own hands. I'm innocent. The Jews would have understood that because in Ezekiel 33, the prophet Ezekiel had been called to be a watchman on the walls. And he was called to warn the people of Israel to turn back to God again. And God said to Ezekiel, uh, as I was preparing yesterday morning, this is what I, and this is in your, in your notes as well, those of, you that have Chine, those, those of you that have Chinese, God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if you don't warn them and wickedness comes, you're responsible. Because God had given him a responsibility. But he said, but if you do warn them, then the responsibility is theirs. If they respond positively or if they reject, then it's their responsibility. And he said, and if you've done that, then you are innocent. As I was preparing yesterday morning, uh, those of you that are in the prayer group know that I sent out a prayer request as well for this friend of mine in the US that has, they've discovered that he has cancer and has at most six weeks to live. And this is a very, he and his wife are very, very good friends of mine. And as I was preparing, I had been praying about it. And as I was preparing yesterday morning, I was reading this verse and I was thinking about it and I was thinking about it in relation to Paul and the Holy Spirit suddenly gripped my heart and I realized and I'm not boasting I'm not I just want to just want to share with you I realized I'm responsible 
this is a this is a friend a close friend and I've talked to I've tried to talk about Jesus before in a personal way but um, they are happy to talk in a general way but never in a personal way and the Holy Spirit gripped my heart and I, I realized I'm responsible and I read that passage and I stopped my sermon preparation and I went online and I bought a ticket back to the US for for uh, for a short time and I'm leaving Wednesday to go back to the US because he has at most six weeks and the doctor said it could be any time. I'm responsible. And brothers and sisters, I, I don't want to offend anyone this morning. We're not called to do what Paul was called to do. We're not. Nobody here is. Nobody here is Paul. We're not called. We're not responsible for everybody. But I do believe we're responsible for somebody. We are. We're responsible for somebody. And I don't know who that is because I don't know your circle of people. And I'll be really honest with you. I'm going back in fear and trembling. That's what Paul says as well. What am I going to say? How am I going to say it? What it I, I don't know, but I'm responsible. I'm not responsible to make sure that he has to say yes, but I'm going to do all I can. I'm responsible. And so I believe we're all responsible. We're all responsible in some way. And we have to do what God calls us to do. And I want to, to, to challenge you as we look at this and as we think about Paul. Um, Andreas, can you take me back to uh, slide seven? Slide seven again. Thank you. If you'll just take me back there. Okay. Uh, can you take me back up? Not, not all the clicks, just the, yeah. I, I, I really want to challenge you in this, and I, I really mean that. And if I offend anyone, come talk to me afterwards. I, I don't intend to offend anyone. But I believe we're all responsible for somebody. And what I want to say to you is this. Would you ask God to open your eyes to those for whom you have some responsibility? Just say, God, I, who am I responsible for? Does it mean all the responsibility is on you? No, because they're responsible also. And there are other people that God will call across their paths. But brothers and sisters, I'm not responsible for everybody but I'm responsible for this person that I'm going back for. And, and we are too. So ask God, because God knows. Because God is your boss. I'm not your boss. God's your boss, right? And he gives each one of us responsibility. And so Paul fulfills his responsibility there, even though they respond very, very negatively. And so he says, okay, I'm going on. What's the next response? I, I, I like this. <laughs> The Jews must, and we've got just a few more minutes, but stay with me. I love this part. It's so ironic. Look with me at verse 7. He says, I'm leaving. <laughs> and he goes next door. <laughs> Isn't that great? He leaves the synagogue because they don't want to hear it, but he doesn't go very far, does he? He goes next to door to the house of a man named Titius Justus. This would have been a Greek who had become, uh, was a God worshiper and then had opened his heart. He was a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. So Titius Justus opens his house. Well, you can't preach in the synagogue, but you can preach in my house. Um, that must, they must have, the Jews must have just hated that, right? That old Paul, look at that. He's only three steps away. In fact, the Bible the, indicates that probably there was a shared wall between the synagogue and this, and this home. So right there, God has a good sense of humor, doesn't he? So, there's, so he goes there, and here's one response. And then look at eight. This is great. Who's the synagogue leader? Crispus. What does Crispus do? He believes, okay? So he's the head of the synagogue with all these Jews saying, Oh, we reject you. Jesus is not the Messiah. And Crispus himself, the leader of the synagogue, believes his whole family, his whole household. Isn't that great? As we look at the response. And then many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. Were baptized. A true mark of conversion um, in those days and still so important. I love this response because we see this and then we move into just in these few closing minutes we move into this last part but I, I love this. I love this pattern because we keep, see this response um, very negative here but God is working and then there's really good response um, right in the lion's den if you will and then okay th yeah there it was I had it in the right place ha here we go. So on your own, you can read that. That's Ezekiel. So they resisted and they blasphemed. Okay, so we saw all of these things that happened, all of this, all the way through. 
And then after this, look with me very quickly, and this is where we get, this is where I got the, the title here. In the night, God appears to Paul, and what does he say? He says, Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. Why would God say this to Paul? I, I used to, by the way, I used to misunderstand this verse. I used to think, oh, that must, oh, so there were a lot of Christians in Corinth. That is not what it means. That's not what it means. God appears to Paul and he says, don't be afraid. Why would, why would God say that to Paul? Why? Was he, do you think he was battling some fear, perhaps? I think he had to have been. If there was no fear and there was no whatever, no need for God to say that, right? So God appears to him and says, don't be afraid. Why does he say that? Because, that's right, we know, right? In Philippi, beaten, thrown in prison when, when God began to move and to work. In Thessalonica, in Berea, run out of town by angry mobs as the Jews grew jealous at the response to the Lord. What's happening in Corinth right now? People are responding to the Lord, right? Many people are being baptized. Y'all, sorry, my southern just came out. Y'all, <laughs> okay, <laughs> my southern just came out. Paul was human. Don't think of him as a superhero floating off the ground. He was human as you and I are human. He had on his back still the scars of being beaten and scourged and thrown in that prison in Philippi. And then here's this great response to the gospel. I can tell you Paul is thinking, Paul's probably almost cringing. When is the mob? When, when, when is the next blow? Because remember when God called Paul in the very beginning? He said, I have called him to go far away to preach to the Gentiles and I have shown him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul knew that was part of his call. He knew that that was part and parcel. All the great work, but along with it went great suffering. And so I can imagine Paul says, what's coming next? What's coming next? And God appears to him and says, don't be afraid. I want to encourage you this morning. I said, let's look at this and get some lessons for ourselves. Some of you this morning are afraid. You're going through something and you think, oh God, what's going to happen? And I want to encourage you because you are in the will of God. Listen, you're in the will of God. You're doing what God has called you to do. And yet there's trouble and there may be some temptation to fear. Keep on doing what you're doing. Don't be afraid. Don't stop. Trouble does not mean you're out of the will of God. Let God encourage you and you keep on going. And God says to Paul, don't be afraid, keep on speaking. In other words, you keep on doing what I've called you to do. Brothers and sisters, when you know what God has called you to do, whatever it is, whether it is in a specific type of ministry, whether it is in your business or in work, because we're called also to secular work as well. We're called to many of these things. When you know God has called you to do it, keep on doing it. Don't stop. Don't stop until God says stop. Remember when we talked about the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, a couple of months ago? He gives direction, he gives correction, and he gives encouragement. And here, God gives Paul encouragement. Keep on. Just keep on. And he says, I am with you. Oh, okay. Get this lesson as well. You say, of course God is with him. God is everywhere. Listen, brothers and sisters, there are times when you and I need, oh, the kids are hot. Come on in, kids. You can come on in. It's hot. Just come in quietly, okay? Just come in quietly, and we'll finish up right now, okay? We're, we're going to, they're going to come in quietly. Keep, wait, meep, meep, meep. <laughs> keep your focus this way. They're coming in. Um, they're coming in. They're going to stand in the back. The youth are coming in. Listen, so, don't take this the wrong way. But sometimes the promises of the Bible are not enough. Okay? I'm not preaching heresy. We know the Word of God. We know that He says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. But how many of you know that there are times when you go through something and God the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and He, 
He breathes life into a word, and you know God's talking to you at that moment. There are times when we need that. And I encourage you, if some of you, you believe you're in the will of God, but you're battling fear this morning, you think, God, what, what do I do? What do I do? You go to God and say, God, I need to hear from you. God, I need a fresh word from you. That God's, God's not going to say, you bad Christian. You're such a weak Christian. Look at you. you. You don't know any better than that. Why are you stumbling? Does God rebuke Paul, the great apostle? No. He just says, hang in there, Paul. Hang in there, Paul. And he says, no one's going to lay a hand on you. That's a special promise because he'd already said, Paul, you're going to suffer a lot. But in this city of Corinth, he was going to do something special. And here we have the title, because I have many people in this city. What does that mean? And we close with this this morning. When, when God says, I have many people in this city, what he meant was there are many people who are yet going to hear the gospel message and they're going to believe. And they're going to turn to me and they're going to be delivered from their immoral lifestyles of adultery, of male prostitution, of homosexuality, of drunkenness, of all of these things that bind the people of this world they're going to hear the gospel from you and they're going to come out of darkness. I have many people, brothers and sisters around you, the work that God has for you to do, the people that God wants you to speak to. He has people. Think of it this way to you. I have many people around. Hear from God. Don't be afraid and keep going. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for our brother Paul, that he just kept on going. Lord, we thank you that you didn't condemn him and say, why are you such a weak and wimpy Christian? But instead you encouraged. And so, Lord, we receive your encouragement this morning as well to do the work that you've called us to do. Lord, we know that you don't condemn us. But, Lord, we do know that we're responsible for someone. And so, Lord, help us. God, we admit we don't know how to do it always. We don't always have the words. We admit that we're kind of scared sometimes. But would you give us eyes to see those that we are responsible for? Oh, Lord, we, we don't want an unspoken word allowing someone to slip away into eternity without knowing you. We don't want that, Lord. Help us to do our part. Help us to do our part and then just trust that you will do your part as you work in their hearts. We, we mean it, Lord. Help us. Help us. We love you, and we're going to walk with you. And we don't want to be afraid. We don't want to, we want to keep on speaking, because we know you're with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.